needed. H.L. Mencken was wrong about a lot of things, but he was right when he said, for every complex problem there is a solution that is clear, simple, and wrong. A city's a complex problem, wouldn't you agree? An unlikely friendship once developed in response to the question of what kind of complex problem a city is. Jane Jacobs, probably the most important urban thinker of the 20th century, once received a letter from a Greek Orthodox priest named Timothy Petitsis. Jacobs was the New Yorker who led an effort to stop an expressway that would have decimated Greenwich Village in the 1960s, a movement not unlike one in here in Memphis that kept I-40 from plowing through my evergreen neighborhood in Overton Park. In the last chapter of the death and life of great American cities, Jacobs argues that much of the damage done to cities in the 20th century was by planners who didn't understand the kind of problem a city is. She said they either thought the problem was too simple or they thought it was too complex. Sometimes they thought both of those things at once. A simple problem is one that an individual mind can solve rationally. So to use our local example, if the problem is just how many cars you can get most efficiently from Little Rock to Nashville, the arithmetic isn't actually that hard. And everybody knows the shortest distance between two points is a line. But when a problem gets infinitely complex, like how many people on a given Thursday will decide to drive from Little Rock to Nashville, well, we actually have ways of solving that one as well. Even though all the thoughts and all the heads and all the events on all the calendars for every person in central Arkansas, plus chance and accident along the way, amount to an almost infinite number of variables, statistical averages predict pretty well about how many people will be on that road. Jane Jacobs argued that city planners thought they could solve a city's problems even through simple analysis of a few variables or statistical analysis of an uncountable number. But she said a city neighborhood is something else, it's something in between. It's more like a living organism that must maintain a kind of active living balance if it's to stay healthy. You don't want your doctor prescribing blood pressure medicine based on what the average American needs, do you? She needs to take into consideration how all sorts of things are in relationship in your particular body if your health and wholeness is the goal. The same is true for a living neighborhood like Evergreen or a place like Overton Park. The health and miracle of both depend on tending to this delicate balance that's never quite the same in one place and time as it is in another. Well, Timothy Petitza's letter said that Jacobs' work convinced him that cities are best understood as liturgies. And this is true, really, he wrote, not just by way of religious interpretation. It's actually the best description of this most complex form of human life with its constant surprise, open-endedness, and being formed by the plans of many. Much to his surprise, Jane Jacobs, a lifelong agnostic, replied to his letter saying, you are so much the best interpreter of my work that I'm aware of that you're actually showing me what my own books mean. Now we Episcopalians, truthfully, can be a little precious about liturgy sometimes, as if it's a collection of tasteful historical artifacts or a reverent form of self-help. Dr. Petitsis and Ms. Jacobs are convincing me, however, that Liturgy is actually how all human life is ordered. And if a city like Memphis or a block like this one is to become a fuller expression of shalom or the peaceable kingdom or the reign of God, it will be because we realize we have a small but meaningful part to play in a larger liturgy that any one of us can possibly imagine. So what does any of this have to do with the first chapter of Acts? Well, for one thing, Christians can tend to talk about the ascension as if it were the end of incarnation. 
Just as we can assume that when the deacon sends us forth out into the world at the end of the Eucharist, we are finished with our liturgy and re-entering ordinary life where different rules apply. But the God who holds all things in being is still the God of incarnation. Just as our liturgies exist within a cosmos that is liturgical always and everywhere. Throughout his ministry, you probably remember, Jesus' followers would often ask when he was going to fix things. They wanted to know when he was going to restore this kingdom of Israel, solving their problems like a proper Messiah was supposed to, presumably with a bigger army than the emperor had. And 40 days after the resurrection, did you notice, the apostles are still asking the very same Is this the time when you'll restore the kingdom of Israel? To be fair, their problem was very real. Jesus may have been raised, but Jews were still living under Roman occupation. His crucifixion had been a vivid reminder of that. Crucifixion wasn't a Jewish thing. It was the empire's way of instilling fear and controlling would-be rabble-rousing subjects. But Jesus' consistent response to this question before and after the resurrection, might be summarized. For every complex problem, there's a solution that is clear, simple, and wrong. That ascension day on the hillside, he put it like this. God's ways and timelines are not yours to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus says once again that his incarnate presence will be among people more than it will be within them. He sends them all back to Jerusalem, to the city where his Holy Spirit will blow through their lives on Pentecost. And when it does... People who speak different languages and come from different cultures, as people in cities always have, all of these people will hear each other, understand each other, and find a different source of power in their lives from the conflict and the competition, the the warring and the retribution that followed the scattering way back at the Tower of Babel. That, in the book of Acts, is how the power of resurrection makes its way incarnately into our lives because this is a liturgical cosmos. It's in the complexity of life with other people that Jesus still comes to us not riding in on a white horse with a sword. A week ago, I was standing just inside the doors of this church waiting for an usher to ring the great bell that calls us into this Sunday liturgy. I love the bustle of that moment as late folks scurry up into church, getting quieter as they feel the stillness others have made ready for them in this room. It was that moment when Richard Hendricks leaned over to me and said, the Penske van full of organ pipes was stolen last night. Many of you, and actually much of Memphis and people with connections to Calvary around the world now, had your own experience receiving this unthinkable news. Mine just happened a little earlier. I hoped Kristen hadn't heard. Not yet. I learned later that she had, and I still have no idea how she stayed upright, much less played the piano, directed our choirs. But as our energies turned toward the search in the hours and the days to come, something came into focus for me in a way it never had before. The strange fact was that Those pipes were utterly invaluable to us and worth next to nothing out there in the world. A van with a few dozen catalytic converters would be worth much more than this load of our precious tin to a thief, which is how it hit me, that the value wasn't inherent in the pipes. Value is something humans impart and imbue on one another, even to beautiful objects shock and heartbreak and all those expressions of love and solidarity around those invaluable, worthless pipes that spread so fast and so far last week. It became a liturgy that drew us all in in a very real sense, did it not? It was fired 
by all the life and love and beauty that had made its way into this world through Calvary's organ over the past almost 90 years. The value wasn't in the metal, but in the hymns and anthems that passed from sheet music through pedals and keys and circuits into bellows and pipes and then out into the air of this great nave, accompanying the voices of choirs from restless children and katas to our calm knowing elders all of whose music's first purpose is to support ordinary voices like yours and like mine in our praise. And since Joseph Rotella and his crew of craftspeople were in here tending so carefully to the instrument when the theft occurred, the stunned silence and sadness in this room as they carried on with their work on Monday made their reverence for their trade and for that instrument palpable. Their affection, as surely as their skill, also filled our worthless pipes with great value. Add to these the unexpected grace some stranger received for free from a prelude at Lenten preaching or a centennial presentation of Handel's Messiah, or maybe most vividly of all, in the three Calvary young people who each told Kristen separately this spring that they wanted to learn her ancient craft whenever she thought they were ready. There's a thread, or maybe a breath, that connects all of these moments, isn't there? In them or through them, you can, can you sense the beautiful complexity of this whole liturgical cosmos in which we live and move and sing and play and have our being, which gets expressed in a local peculiar beauty in time, among the likes of us right here at Calvary. The lost pipes would just be old tin cylinders were it not for their place and use in that sacred human, human liturgy on which our lives are always depending, all of the time, everywhere. I suppose our problem now is what to do in response. It would make a kind of self-protective sense just to hunker down in fear of what, might else, what else might go wrong. And I'll admit to you that a part of me wants retribution. Part of me wants somebody to pay. But the clear, simple solution this world so quickly turns to is fear and then punishment, is it not? But these clear, simple solutions aren't working. They never have. Which must be why even from the cross, Jesus just wouldn't play along. Forgive them, Father, he prayed, even then. They think this is a solution, but they still just don't know what they're doing. But what would he have us do? Well, I think he'd send us right back down into our Jerusalem. Back down into the city where the Holy Spirit still moves through incarnate people who don't speak the same dialects or come from the same countries or the same parts of town. When Jesus found fearful people huddled in locked upper rooms or out on hillsides staring up at the sky, he sent them right back down to the city, right back into the liturgy of life in this world that he so loves, the incarnate liturgy in which His holy and life-giving Spirit is still to be found. 